All right. So what's interesting to me about this, or what interested me about this when Lila brought it up was it's something that I didn't do in my course, that I didn't do in my traditional astrology course. And for Sarah and Amy who are new, um, oh, go ahead and mute yourselves for a while. You may have, go ahead and mute yourself now, um, because unless you have a question, you can always write the question in or feel free to raise your hand and ask. But um, if you're not muted, go ahead and do that. Um, secondly, uh, the reason I brought, thought it would be a good idea to do was because I didn't include it in the medieval astrology class. And I'm going to put into the chat right now the medieval astro the link to a bu bunch of different things. One is my medieval astrology course. One is my, uh, oh, it's my Google page that has a review. So if you've liked this, please feel free to leave a review. And that's so that uh, all of the links are there. Um, my website, et cetera, but especially to, um, especially to the, whatever it was I was just talking about. Anyway, I'm doing too many things at one time and getting lost. Okay, so I didn't include it in the, in the medieval astrology course, and that was what I was talking about, the medieval astrology course, and the link to the medieval astrology course should be in the chat. Um, and it's, if not, it's uh, on the YouTube, it's on the, right on the front page of the YouTube channel. Um, and that's completely free and it's huge. It's like 17, it's 17 weeks, about two hours of a course of each. And um, people here were in it with me and you know, we, we slogged through the whole thing. Okay, so I didn't include it, and but I have used it. And I have used it sparingly. But one of the things, I, the caveat I want to start with is that all of the authors say, hey, you know, you, this is not that easy to determine. You know, there are these, we can give you the rules for determining this, but ultimately this is not that easy to determine. And um, there are these things that go into, first of all, I love this picture, so I want to start with the picture. Um, and so there are the things that we should really be looking at, and there are the things that we should be looking at, but then at the same time, there are the things that we should take into consideration before we do it. And what that really entails what that ends up entailing is the genetics of the family. So that can affect the looks. So that obviously makes sense. So the genetics of the family can affect things. What's going on with planets can affect things. Um, what's going on with the type of year. So we'll, we'll see all of the different factors, but there were factors for why it's not an easy thing to do. And I think that's the very first thing that we have to kind of look at um, or not look at, but kind of consider before we do anything else, is that there are reasons that it's hard. It's a hard thing to kind of to take care of and kind of, to kind of really pin down. And some people are better at it than others, et cetera. And there are some better rules. And you'll see that I've included three different off rules from three different authors. And so we're, we're going to look at those, um, those particular rules. And then we're going to look at the techniques from two of the authors, right? So we're gonna look at rules, but then we're gonna actually just kind of look at two techniques from two of them. So let's see, so going on. So the first one starts with this Bonatti, which is on the form and the shape. And so as, I've, as the title itself says, we're talking about the ascendant and the ascendant is the body. It is the life, it's, it's called the house of life. And it's also the ingenium or talent. But this is the first kind of technique for it. If, and if you want to know who it is, you're going to look at the ascendant and you're going to look to the Lord. Now, we're going to come back to this because this word al-mubtaz, we're going to come back to when we actually look at the technique. But this is kind of the basic of, basis of it. So look at the sign on the ascendant and then look at the planet that rules the sign on the ascendant, that's kind of at its most basic foundation what it is that we're talking about. And that is, so the planet, so the issue is that the planet itself represents a body type, and then the sign that the planet in represents the body type. And when we go to the next slide, you'll see kind of what we're looking at. It is necessary that you consider the admixture of the significator, both planets and signs. So what did I just say? The planet itself has a body type. The sign has a body type. And so the sign modifies the planet and of the places of the circle coming together to attribute a form or shape. So that also means that where it is affects it. And we're going to talk a little bit more about that when we talk about seasons and temperament. Um, and as he says, so you're going to find 
someone is not going to be simply Saturnine or jovial. So those of us who have the Sagittarius rising, the Jupiter is that's the jovial that he's talking about. So we're not going to be just jovial. It's going to be dependent on the sign that Jupiter is in, right? In my case and in Layla's case, we both have Jupiter and Gemini in Mercury signs. So Mercury is going to have a lot to do with how we look and how we come up, come across physically. Same thing. So any planet. It basically is saying there's always going to be some kind of admixture and you're always going to be trying. And that's one of the things that I find with uh, people kind of involved in astrology now. There's a real problem with figuring, with understanding how to mix significations. And so, and the thing is, I remember somebody actually even wrote, so how do you mix combine things? And I said, you combine them by combining them. And it's true. You combine them by combining them. Hi, Kimmy. Welcome. We've just started and we're just we're just getting to the we, you're, you really haven't missed that much, even though it looks like we're right in the midst of it, but we're not. And if anything that you kind of want to understand. Oh, and here's back at Anna Louise again. And if there's anything that you want to understand, you want to understand this where we are right here, which is that we're starting from the ascendant, which is the rising sign. So take note of what your ascendant is. And then the planet that rules the ascendant. And so take note of the planet that rules it. And if there's anybody who doesn't know what planets rule, what signs, you should put that in the chat for me. And, um, and we'll go through that at some point. And, uh, but hold on a second. Okay, so, so we were just talking about the fact that, yes, even though, so astrology is all about adding influences, combining influences. And so we were just talking about the fact that, okay, yeah, we've just established the foundation of this, which is ascendant and ruler of the ascendant. But now he's also saying, but you're going to have to look and add mixed things and mix things in because it's not just the planet. It's also the sign that the planet is in. So if you have Scorpio rising and your Mars, Mars will Scorpio and your Mars is in um, Gemini, then that Merc Mercury rules Gemini. So the Mercury in your chart is going to affect how you look. Right. And also Gemini has its own physical traits. So Mars will have his traits, but the fact that he's in Gemini will actually add those traits. And that's the admixture of the significators that he's talking about. And so we're going to look at all of the planets and their body types and all of the zodiac signs and their body types today. And hopefully we'll be able to get a matter of fact, we're not going to matter of fact, I made it an uh, executive decision today. We're not going to get to moles and birthmarks. We will do moles and birthmarks next week um, when we also look at our planet of, of the week. And oh, and what we've decided is we're going to try to make this a little bit of a, of a planetary magic thing. The planet for next week needs to show up this week, right? So somehow we're going to find a way for the planet that I'm going to talk about next week is going to show up in this week's meeting. Okay, so we've established that the ascendant and the ruler of the ascendant are the foundation of how we find our physicality. Then we also know that we also need to mix the significations based on the planet and the sign that it occupies and the places of the circle. Now, he could be saying, oh, it's in the 10th house. How does that affect it? But, it, but the 10th house is the south. And the South is represents a certain, a certain uh, what's the word I'm looking for? How do you sign up for next week? Oh, um, I'll I'll send you. Actually, you sign up for next week. If you've already signed up via Eventbrite, then I have your email address and I will include that. If if you want to be included and did not sign up via Eventbrite, you just came in through the Zoom link, then feel free to put your your um, email into the chat and I will put you onto the list and make sure that you're included for next week when we look at the at the planet. So next week is planets. Week after is houses. And or, or a specific house. So it's deep dive next week into planets, deep dive into houses the week after. And then we look at um, a text that I've been working with that we've been working with at the, uh, at the end of the month. All right. So I think I've belabored this point enough. I hope everybody understands um, what is what we what we're talking about. But understand and look at even with these little bullet points under here. And even the sign puts some of its own influence into it, which is what we've just been talking about. And likewise, the position of the place in the circle of signs, which he also mentioned there. And as I touched on above, the essence of the family relations. So the genetics, 
Yes, this is being, this is, oh, someone's just asking if it's being recorded. And yes, it is being recorded and you will have access to it. And the links to the YouTube channel are in the chat there. Okay. And so the, that's, remember when I was mentioning family relations? So he's actually talking about that there. Okay. So I thought this would be an interesting one to look at for a second here. Um, so Montuomo, so Bonatti, who we were just looking at, he's from the 13th century. Montuomo, who we're, we're going to look at right now, is from the 15th century. Then we're going to look at Lily, and Lily is where we're going to kind of put most of our um, attention to, and that's from the 17th century. So we kind of skip 200 years to kind of see if things have changed, if things have developed, if things have gotten more detailed. Um, things are pretty detailed in the 13th century, mind you, but just to kind of look and see. So the master considers the lucid, and once again, they're still doing the same thing. They're mentioning all of the Arabs from the 10th and the 9th and the 8th century. Haley judges the face of the by the ascendant. Okay, so that might be something you didn't know. Haley, so the face was primarily judged by the ascendant. Likewise, the ascendant signifies the body, which we know, and the almutant of the ascendant, we're going to talk about almutants later on in the uh, workshop, and the almutant of the ascendant principally signifies the face. For right now, think ruler of the ascendant, right? But we will talk about the difference between the ruler and the almutant. Okay, and sometimes the Almutin and the ruler are the same planet, but not always. Okay, and then, so we've, we've just kind of found some little tidbit. The face is the ascendant, right? Why? Because the first house is the ascendant, which represents the head. So the face is involved with the head, or the face is attached to the head, so that makes perfect sense. In tallness or shortness of stature, consider the positions of the significator in the far or nearer distance of its eccentric. Now it's talking about its distance from the sun or its distance on the ecliptic. So it's apogee or perigree, um, which I don't really work with that much. So that part we'll kind of not really look at. Um, likewise, signs of the long ascensions give tall stature and those of short ascension, short stature. We, I have a little list of the, of the long ascension and the short ascension. So basically, a sign of tall stature or long ascension is signs from Cancer to Sagittarius. And short ascension are from Capricorn to Gemini. Okay, so once again, long ascension or crooked ascension, they're also called, are from Capricorn no, no, sorry, Cancer to Sagittarius. Short Ascension, Capricorn to Gemini, all right? Likewise, a direct significator, right? Venus is about to go retrograde, so she would make the person fat, right? So direct significator says lean. A retrograde significator says fat. Now, I don't know why that's the case, and this is the only place I've seen that. Similarly, first station, so that's right before the planet goes retrograde, strong bodies, the second station, weak ones. Now that doesn't really make sense to me because the second station is usually when things are going from being weak. Matter of fact, remember Layla, we just talked about this in, in detail and Anne Louise last week about the difference between the first station and the second station and why the retrograde was the evil and the second station was leaving the evil. So that doesn't make sense to me. When the significator is occulted, meaning that it is combusted, it signifies a body disposed to the receiving of all manner of misfortunes, which makes sense because there was a belief that um, combustion was the worst kind of impediment for any kind of planet. Um, is there anybody here who does not know what combustion means? Combustion means when a planet is within eight degrees of the sun and um, within 17 degrees or 12 or 15 degrees of, a sun, of the sun, a planet is considered under the rays. It is between, eight, within eight degrees of the sun, it is called combustion. And so what does it mean when a planet is combusted? Basically, it weakens the planet because the sun is extremely hot and extremely dry. And so the closer, and of course, remember, the sun is the source of light and the source of heat in the, in the universe, so, or in the solar system, that is, right? So as the planet gets closer and closer, it starts to get burned out by the sun, and the sun grabs it and takes it on as its own. So it kind of takes on the signification as its own. So, well, it, someone needs to uh, put themselves to mute yep. themselves. There we go. Perfect. 
All right, great. All right, so we can see here, this is just a little preliminary of the shapes of the body. So what he actually said was, hey, go back to my book and look at what I said about everything. Because, but he says, the stature of the body principally is to judge tall or low from that planet who doth partially behold the Lord of the ascendant. If many do behold him, then judge from the strongest. So what's the first thing he said? Beholding it means that there's an aspect to it. So we see that Saturn gives a moderate stature, declining towards shortness. Jupiter, a short stature. Oh, well, let's first of all, sorry about this. What does this stuff mean? Oriental, Occidental. We've got a, a complete beginners here in the chart in, that are ta asking things here. So Oriental is another term for Eastern. And in case you didn't know it, the ascendant is the eastern point of the chart. So put your finger on the ascendant, that's the east. And we call it the ascendant because like the sun that rises in the east, at the moment of your birth, a zodiac sign goes over the horizon and that is your rising sign. And that is what we're talking about here. And why are we talking about physical appearance? Because this whole issue of the sign coming over the horizon makes the sign visible. And so the first house has to do with visibility. The first house is also the ascendant. So for those of you who are absolutely at the beginning of your journey, ascendant means first house, means visibility, means east means the minute that I was born in the location that I was born in, a sign was going up over the horizon. And that's what the ascendant is. And that's why we call it the rising sign. And that's also why we call it the first house, because it's the beginning of everything. It's the beginning of the entire chart. Do I have a question here? Okay, so someone knows that they are a Virgo, a double Virgo with Taurus rising. All we're looking at right now is the Taurus rising part. But we would also look at the planet that rules Taurus, which is Venus. So in your particular case, you have a Taurus rising, right? That would be the ascendant or first house of the chart. Okay, so everything, so your eastern point, so your due east would be Taurus. So for everybody here who's got an ascendant, who, and everybody here does, of course, that's your east. That is your due east. If your Sagittarius rises like me, Sagittarius is your due east. If Taurus rises, that's your due east. Okay? That also means it's the first thing we look at when we're looking at looking for your physical shape. Then the next thing we look at is the ruler of the ascendant, the planetary ruler of the ascendant, who is the ruler of the sign on the cusp of the ascendant, in your case, Taurus. So Taurus is ruled by Venus. So in your case, Venus is the ruler of the ascendant. This is important that we understand this connection, right? Because this is everything we're talking about. Venus is the ruler of the ascendant for Taurus and Libra. In case if we have any Libra risings in here, then that will be the situation for you. Matter of fact, I'll just go through it right now before we move on. Venus for Taurus and Libra, Mercury for Gemini and Virgo, Mars for Aries and Scorpio, Jupiter for Sagittarius and Pisces, Saturn for Capricorn and Aquarius, the Moon for Cancer, Sun for Leo. Did I miss anybody? I don't think I did. Okay. So yes. So I didn't miss anyone. All right. So those are the those are the seven classical planets and the and the signs that are they are ruling. And so if we're looking and you're looking only at your ascendant. So if we're looking at our ascendant and it says Sagittarius, then we're looking for Jupiter. If we're looking for at our ascendant and it says Taurus, then we're looking for Venus. So now, knowing now that Taurus is rising. Find the Venus in your chart and clue your, and and be thinking about as we go on what we're talking about here as we move on. Okay, so where I was just going was this idea of Oriental and Occidental. Oriental means East. So if you have your finger on the Ascendant, 
put it over to the seventh house, slide it over. The, that matter of fact, that line you're sliding it over is called the horizon. And so slide it over the horizon to the other half, to the other side. That's your seventh house. That's called the descendant, right? The sun rises and descends in the west. That's the western point. That's the occident, right? So the orient is the ascendant. And the occident is the descendant or seventh house. So going down from there, the bottom of the chart, the fourth house, that's north. And going up, the midheaven, the MC, that's south. Those are the four directions of the chart. And they are to be used. They are to be used for by everybody. You can decide what's the best part of the world for you, you to live in based on what planets are in which particular quarter of the chart. Is it in the southwestern quarter? There was just a, a, a chart on Reddit today where somebody was said, does my chart confirm moving to the northeast? And indeed it did. So these things are things that we don't often think about because we're usually conflating psychology and astrology, but there's a whole other way that astrology can be used. So when we're saying oriental, what we're really saying is is it east of the sun, right? The sun is the, the, because the sun is basically everything, right? And if we're saying occidental, we're saying, is it west of the sun? So is it, so if you look at your sun, note the planets that are in either degrees earlier, if you don't understand degrees, that's fine, or signs earlier. So if your sun is in uh, Virgo, somebody said they had a sun in Virgo. Note if you have anything in Leo, or note if you have anything before it in Virgo earlier than the sun in Virgo, those planets would be oriental. And if you have anything behind the sun, if so using Virgo once again as our, as our um, example, if you have anything behind the sun in Libra, Scorpio, those planets will be occidental or west of the sun. So whenever we use oriental or occidental, we're always using it in relation to where the sun is. So we've already learned a lot of things, right? We've already learned that the ascendant is east, but also that the ascendant is visibility, and also that the ascendant is the body, and that the ascendant is the first house, all of that, all of those things, right? We've just learned, and that the ascendant is the house of life, right? So those those are all really important aspects to, under, to understand about the first house. It basically, the ascendant is how the world sees us. Uh, it's not our public persona, mind you. It's who we are. And it's basically how we present physically and as far as inclination and what the uh, ancient astrologers would call wit. So I'm just going to zip through this and then we're going to move. So Oriental Saturn is moderate. Remember, Saturn would need to be earlier than the sun. Occidental, Saturn is short. He'd need to be behind the sun. Oriental Jupiter is tall. Occidental Jupiter is moderate. And we'll go back over this Oriental Occidental with charts, mind you, so, so that you can really get a visual of what I'm talking about. But if you're looking at your own chart, which you should be, then you should be looking at your sun and you should be saying, oh yeah, Mercury, if my sun's in Virgo, Virgo Mercury's in Leo. Or my son's at 12 degrees of Virgo, Mercury is at 3 degrees of Virgo. And that would be an, ox an oriental planet. Or vice versa. Something else is in Libra. Ah, that planet is occidental. That planet is western. Okay? So Mars oriental tall. Mars occidental moderate. Mars, uh, Venus oriental tall and slender. Uh, Venus occidental short. Mercury oriental middle stature. Occidental small stature. So I, want, I bet I know what he's going to say about Mercury down here. I have got the little thing here. Oh, perfect. So what he says is observable that Mercury, whether he be oriental or occidental, doth form the body according to the nature of his dispositor. So those of you who are really new to astrology and to this, I, let's talk about Mercury for just one second. Mercury, the planet Mercury, and those that have Virgo ruling the uh, sun and moon, somebody said they were a double Virgo, that means Mercury is the ruler of Virgo, so we're, it'll be germane to you. Mercury is the hermaphrodite of the zodiac. And not only is he hermaphrodite, he is neutral. He's, he's actually not considered benefic or malefic because he basically becomes 
whatever, whoever he's with. If he's with the female planet, he becomes female or she becomes female rather. If he's with a, a hot and dry planet, he becomes hot and dry. If he beca- if he's with, so basically Mercury is this mutable convertible kind of slate that turns in, that helps whatever he's with or she's with. So just something to give you a, a different, when we, once again, when we get away from some of these ideas of the planets as uh, only translating into psychological behaviors, then we start to understand their actual behaviors, that the, the planet's actual behavior, and then we, we have more uh, of, of ways that we can translate. Okay, so Lily, this is his technique, and we're going to come back to this after we look at all the different, um, different planetary forms and shapes. But this is his technique. You would look at the ascending sign, so we've already established where that is, right? That's the first house, the ascendant and its Lord. So if there's anybody here, that the, anybody else here who does not know who the Lord of their ascendant is, please put your ascendant in the chat and I will tell you. Okay, and the planet or planets in the ascendant or aspecting it. Okay, so if you've got planets in the first house, especially in the same sign as the ascendant, Right. So often you see questions from people asking, well, I've got this ascendant, but this other sign is in my first house. Which is it? And so the ascend the sign on the cusp is the ascendant. But let's say you've got like me, 27 degrees of Sagittarius rising. That means you're going to have quite a bit of Capricorn in the first house. Which means if you've got a planet like me in Capricorn in the first house, it will still have an effect, but it might not have as strong as an effect as it would if you had a planet in Sagittarius. So that's why I'm saying what I said. So if you've got planets in the first, that's cool. If you've got planets in the first in the same sign as the ascendant, they will have even more of an, of an effect on your physicality. The lights, okay, so the lights are the sun and moon, um, and especially depending on if it's a day chart or a night chart, and those of you who are new, we'll get, we're going to talk about that. The season of the year. <clears throat> so that's something interesting, that the season actually affects things. And then fixed stars on or near the ascendant. And we're, we're not going to really look at the fixed stars thing, although that might be something to look at later on. So as you can see, he says this is handled in, here and there. But look here, we start to get an idea of what kind of bodies the signs give us. Aries, Taurus, Libra, and Scorpio give us a moderate stature, but more long. Leo, Virgo, and Sagittarius, more tall. Cancer, uh, Capricorn, and Pisces, short. I heard the the water signs generally short, but see, if you see, if you notice here, Aries and Scorpio are the Mars signs, and Taurus and Libra are the Venus signs. So he's saying that Aries, that the Mars signs and the Venus signs give a moderate stature, but more long. Here he's saying that Leo, Virgo, and Sagittarius, they give more tall bodies. And we've got complete three different rulers of each, so there's no, no co- connection necessarily. Um, Cancer, Capricorn, and Pisces, those are short. Now, Cancer and Pisces are both water signs. Capricorn is a, a sign ruled by uh, Saturn. And then Gemini is indifferent. Now, I had heard that Gemini and Virgo were tall, um, and then Aquarius a moderate proportion. We're going to go into that in a little bit of detail later. So the things that are cons- a proportion of the face and members, the sign ascending and its Lord. Okay, so this is a, about the face, right? And we're going to come back to all of this when we look at charts. But as you can see, those of you who are new to this, there's a lot that goes into any judgment about anything in astrology. That's the first thing I need to say. Um, And so a lot of the way that astrology is being uh, being kind of approached right now is in a very almost a kind of glib and superficial way in that, oh, hey, that's there. That should be fine. But look at all of this. In order to really figure out what's going on with the face, we're going to look at the sign ascending. We're going to look at the Lord that rules the sign. We're going to look at the planets that might, or the configurations that are in the ascendant. 
We're going to look at the sun and the moon. We're going to look at the quarter of the year, which means the season, and the fixed stars and the ascendant, which is exactly what we just saw. So I just want to give us a little bit of a, a, some of these are really cool. Human signs. I bet, I bet Amy, Kimmy, you didn't probably know that there are signs that are called human signs. The human signs are Gemini, Virgo, Libra. Gemini, Virgo, Libra, Aquarius, the first part of Sagittarius. Those are the human signs. Gemini, Virgo, Libra, Aquarius, the first half of Sagittarius. That means up to 15 degrees of Sagittarius. And that shows fair and clear complexions. There was a general belief that the human signs showed physical attractiveness, that those were the most attractive signs to have. And why are they called human? Because in the sigil, generally a person is, is pictured. Gemini is twins, is human twins. A virgin holds the wheat in Virgo. Libra, a woman, a blind woman, or Matus, the goddess of justice, holds the scale. Sagittarius, the first half of Sagittarius is, is man, the second half is horse. Aquarius, it's the person that's, uh, what is he doing? Pouring the water, right? So there's a human in them. And so those are called, and also you'll notice that the human signs are the air signs, except for Virgo and the, and the first half of Sagittarius. So all of the air signs are consider, considered human, and it's because of the temperament of air, which is sanguine. And we're going to talk about that in a second. I told you there's so much information that goes into this. It, it seems like, oh, yeah, that should be no problem. But that's why this is probably going to end up being two, um, two weeks of a session. Okay, so Taurus, Cancer, Scorpio, and Pisces show deformity. Those were called deformed signs of deformed limbs. Taurus, Cancer, Scorpio, and Pisces. So the latter part of Aries and Leo, those are called, so those are traditionally, so I have a, so as I mentioned, I've got a, a free traditional astrology course, and one of the courses is called A New Look at the Zodiac, and we talk about all of this stuff in depth in that particular one. So if you're interested in what we're talking about, or you feel like, oh, what the hell is he talking about? I need to get up to speed. Um, please feel free to go to the, to the channel and check that out. It's about another two-hour session. I go into a lot of detail. And in general, if you're new to the kind of stuff I do, I tend to do longer session type things. And all of that stuff is up on YouTube. And feel free to go back to it. You know, do only as much as you can handle and just go back to it and keep learning on it. Um, it's all free. It's all there for you to use. Okay. Jupiter and Venus of all the planets give the best complexions, of course because they're the benefic planets, in case you haven't heard about those. Um, Mercury and the moon next, those are also considered, Mercury, of course, is neutral, but moon is considered, if she's in good shape, a benefic. Ooh, what do we have here? Okay. Oh, you don't see anyone else's chat? Okay, fine. I'll, I'll send that to you in a second, Kim, Kimley. Excellent. Okay, hold on one minute. Okay, so the things that are considered, well, let's see, did we get to everybody? Uh, Jupiter face Saturn, Mars, North Node, and their unlucky configuration to the Ascendant show unhandsomeness and unfortunate in the Ascendant can show a scar or blemish in the face. Now, this, use, this I wanted to bring up because I have seen it happen, and it's also included in Vedic astrology. So Mars in the first sometimes can give a scar on the face. I know we've got somebody with a Jupiter Mars conjunction. In the, no, no, maybe not. We have that, we had a, a, another chart with a Jupiter Mars conjunction, but they didn't have a scar on the face. But definitely K two South Node in, in the in the first house can sometimes create a blemish on the face. Um, and then Sun and Moon, well, dignified show fairness, of course, because because once again there's this idea of lightness, lightness being good. So things that represent light are good. If things are if the light is impedited, notice things that are not going to be so good. Also notice it says if the lights are impedited, there's hurt in the eyes. It's because the sun and the moon represent the right and the left eye respectively, except in females where the sun and the moon represent the left and the right eye. So in females, the sun represents the left, the moon represents the right eye. In males, the sun represents the right, the moon represents the left eye. Okay, so that's why he's talking about if there's a problem with lights being impedited. So you're probably also wondering, what does he mean by impedited and that kind of thing? And when we get to charts, we'll, we'll go over a lot of this jargon that we're looking at. Okay, let's move on for a second. Oh, oh so this is your introduction to temperament. 
Okay, so this is for those of you who haven't already, because I think a majority of you have been with me, so you're like, oh yeah, I know that stuff. But this is your introduction, uh, introduction to temperament for those of you who don't. And it, temperament is a really interesting and, an, and in my opinion, important way uh, or thing to use when looking at things. So remember when we were talking about combustion, one of the things that I mentioned about combustion was the reason combustion is bad is because the sun is excessively hot and dry. That's his temperament. And that temperament, the hot and dry temperament, is called the choleric temperament. Okay, so hot and dry. We're, and the next thing will tell us all about that. But for right now, what you might do is you might just write down spring is sanguine, summer is choleric, autumn is melancholic, and winter is phlegmatic. Those are the four complexions. And, and you can also see then the body. So the sanguine body type is fleshy and lovely. Remember, we talked about human signs. Human signs are sanguine signs. We're, so we're going to get to all of this in a second. I'm so sorry. So what I should have done probably was gone to this. Spring, Aries, this is easier. Spring, which is Aries, Taurus, and Gemini, which is also and which is the air triplicity or element is sanguine. And that's hot or temperamentally, temperamentally hot, not, not like hot, like hot, but hot, like, you know, what's the word I'm thinking of? Tepid or warm. Summer, that's hot. That's choleric, hot and dry. And that's fire. I can't, oh, it's like, I can't really write it. Autumn, Libra, Scorpio, melancholic, cold and dry that's earth winter capricorn aquarius pisces phlegmatic cold and wet that's water so our sanguine temperament is air and we just mentioned that the human signs are air our choleric temperament is fire our melancholic temperament is earth and our phlegmatic temperament is water so with that in mind, so if you've got Virgo rising or if you've got Taurus rising, oh, we had somebody who's got moon, sun, and Virgo and Taurus rising. All three of those signs are what are what element? They're all the earth element. The earth element is cold and dry, which is melancholic. So this person, even if they don't have Saturn involved, they might be inclined towards melancholy. I mean, of course, we'd have to see the chart to know what's really going on, but they might be inclined themselves towards melancholy. Okay, so now with that in mind, I should have had, like I said, I should have had these two mix, uh, in the different order. Um, sanguine, which is air. So look at your, so first thing, look at your ascendant. What element is it? Now look at your chart ruler, <clears throat> the planet that rules the ascendant. What element is that? In my case, Sagittarius is, ru is ruling, or Sagittarius is the ascendant. As a matter of fact, let's just let's just break it up for a second. Let's just break it up for one second. Okay, in this chart, Pisces is rising. What element is that? Water, correct? So we just talked about the four different temperaments. The first temperament we talked about was the sanguine temperament, which corresponds to air. It is hot and wet. The second temperament we talked about was the hot and dry temperament, which is the choleric temperament, which corresponds to fire. The third one was the cold and dry temperament, which corresponds to earth. The fourth is the phlegmatic temperament, the, the third is melancholic. The fourth is the phlegmatic temperament, which corresponds to water. So this is a phlegmatic. So already we're starting to get a certain idea of the nature of the person from the element on the ascendant. Also, it's a double whammy because not only is the sign on the ascendant in a phlegmatic sign, 
but the ruler of the ascendant is in a phlegmatic sign and the ruler of the ascendant is in his own sign. So in this particular chart, this would be a very phlegmatic, or this would have a very kind of phlegmatic influence. Now, phlegmatic cries easily. Like phlegmatic is overly, is um, phlegmatic eats to deal with, to deal with stress. Phlegmatic is, um, can be overly emotionally reactive. So it's important. So this is the when we think about water, the waterworks. So water element is waterworks. The cold and wet, which is phlegmatic, that's what's going on primarily with this chart. We ha he says to also look at the lights at the moon. The moon is in a cold and dry earth sign, which is melancholic. So we've got emotionalism. We've got melancholic, we've got a little bit of melancholy. And then with the sun here, we've got some sanguine finally, right? So sanguine or air sign, Libra. So the melancholic sign will be dry. It might see the glass half empty. It might see a problem. It might see a problem instead of seeing an, uh, an opportunity. Right, so there can be an innate pessimism. One of the things about Virgo is that Virgo sees the problems, right? Virgo sees how to make, how to solve the problems. But in order to solve the problem, you got to see the problem, and Virgo usually sees it. And so that's part of the melancholic temperament. That, and so people might think of Virgos as like my sister's a Virgo, and she's not a, a downer per se, but she can down your high because she will bring up a practical thing. And it's exactly what you need to hear, but you don't want to hear it because you want to be enjoying whatever. And she says, hey, you know, you're right. You're right. This is really great. But you better look at blah, 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 because such and such. That's downer melancholy. It's and it's absolutely what we need. Right. Virgo almost never gives you what you don't need. Right. But it's absolutely what we need. But that's how Virgo is a melancholy. Right. Now, let's talk about how elite or how Libra or air signs can be sanguine. Think about how Gemini, that's kind of like the classic air sign, right? Um, how Gemini has problems getting deeper, right? Gemini can have a problem going deep. It can have a problem with depth. It, it, the social butterfly, remember that Gemini and Virgo and Pisces are the signs that have wings, right? Mercury has wings on his heels. So the, Gemini, when we think of the social butterfly, right? Flip, 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 but never settle, settle, settle. Right. And those of us who dated people with, you know, Venus and Gemini or dated Gemini's or whatever, or who have Jupiter and Gemini and can't commit, you know, we've noticed we've seen those issues with intimacy and depth. So what I'm saying is the sanguine temperament doesn't take things too diff diff uh, difficultly. Things roll off their back. They don't they don't respond or react too much. They are they tend to be more rational. And of course, in this period, in this you know, 13, 15, 16th century period, rationalism is the highest form of human humanity, right? Which is why it's called human. That's what separates us from animals, is that supposedly we're rational. We can we can think rationally. This is really important to people from the to the astrologers and the philosophers of that period of what makes us different from animals. And so that's why the human signs are considered so important. So a human sign is going to take things in stride. A human sign like a human sign like Libra is going to avoid conflict in order to keep things copacetic and, and harmonious and enjoyable. That's that's a negative segment. Right, I've been bringing all the negative aspects of the of the the temperaments, but we can. Uh, we, but you know, we'll also be a wonderful conversationalist, set up things really well in order for um, for things to be beautiful and enjoyable. Um, you know, create a cohesive plan of how things sh can go. I mean, that's also sanguine. Did I miss anybody? Oh, so the the choleric, the fire, the choleric. What does fire do? It it <laughs> it consumes, right? It consumes. So it, it, it enlarges and it consumes. It expands and it consumes. So fire, cholera, cholera, fire cholera can turn it into, can basically turn it into a forest fire, can turn it into a mob, into, into, um, you know, into war. War consumes, right? So really violence and hot-headedness and loss of temper, here's the word temper with temperament, loss of temper, temper, all of that's under cholera. cholera. Cholera would rather hit you than discuss anything. Or cholera acts before they think, right? This chart isn't like that. This chart is, is initially 
looking at the ascendant and the moon. So we're not even at the physical yet. We're just talking about the temperament of the person. The, at, they're, and look, at the part of fortune is there too. They're at the behest of their emotions. But then when we get to the planet that's kind of representing the emotional mind, it's actually quite practical. Where is Mercury? Mercury is in, in, Mercury is in Libra. Mercury is sanguine. So really, maybe this isn't quite as emotionally push, pushy as, we, as I initially thought. This is how we do it. So remember, we were just talking about combining. Like I said, the very first thing as we walk in looked primarily phlegmatic, looked like this person would cry easily, looked like this person might, might, might respond emotionally to pretty much all situations, looked like this person might be very sensual and very into sensation. But then the moon is kind of in the opposite of that. Look, the moon is exactly opposing the Jupiter, right? So the moon is opposing that. So as far as temperament is concerned, we don't have that going. We've got this moon that's saying, hey, wait a second. Yes, I know you're having a really great time with that vibrator, but did you clean it? That's where, we, that's where the melancholy comes in, right? So this, this person probably has a problem with internal, like an internal war of, I can't enjoy anything because I can always see the problems. So my phlegmatic want to kind of go with the flow, my moon gets in the way of that. My melancholic moon that says, hey, did you, t did you bring your list? Gets in the way of that. Okay, so that's where we're, so we have, like I said, we haven't even gotten to looking at the body yet. We haven't even gotten to looking at the body yet, but already just looking at, at our temperaments, just looking at temperament, it's giving us an idea. And we're going to continue to look at this. So the temperaments, fire. So this is really what we needed. Fire, air, water, earth. If you don't have it, write it down. So I hope that those of you who are really new to what's going on. I hope that that made sense. Obviously, please don't hesitate to put something in the um, chat if you don't understand. And I also understand that you might be digesting it. So if you just kind of don't get what the hell I was talking about or where I've just been, then you know, let me know. If you're still digesting it, wait. All right, so I'm just gonna keep that up for one more second so that we can kind of look at that. And then I'm going to go backwards to the types of bodies. Okay, so now that we know what sanguine means, right? So that's the, our air person, personality, fair form or shape, fleshy, loveliness. And remember, we said that human and air signs, that makes a lot of sense. Members more gross when we get to the summer, right? So you should be looking at a few things. You should be looking at what season the signs are. Let me go back. Because that's actually, because this is implying something different. So he's not just implying that we look at the specific, which is what I did, the specific you know, uh, temperament of each thing. He's saying, look to see what is the season of the sign, because that will also mix. And in this particular chart, the season is winter, which is phlegmatic. This is really, really phlegmatic. But like I said, bam, we've got the moon opposing. So the internal and the, the internal person is at war with themselves in this chart. And, and, they, and it's hard for them to enjoy. Who's the ruler of the fifth in this chart? Is it moon? Ah, moon, ah, right? See, so, right, that's exactly what I thought. So, I didn't think it was moon, but I thought it might be Jupiter. But yeah, right, right? But that's it, right? So this person has problems enjoying themselves. And, and it's because of this moon, Jupiter. And I got to that not through all of the other stuff that we've talked about in weeks past. I got to it just through temperament. I got to it just through temperament, y'all, Okay. That's what I'm trying to, that's the point I'm trying to make to you. Just through looking at this idea of temperament, I got to that. So right now, take a moment. Look at the sign on your ascendant. Figure out what season it's in. 
Okay, wait. Oops. Okay, so what season, right? If you're if you're you're ascending as Capricorn Aquarius Pisces, it's winter. Got it? So find out what season you're in. And then I want you to put what temperament that is. And as a matter of fact, do go ahead and put it in put it in the chat for me now. So put into the chat what season your ascendant is. So, and, and so you should say spring sanguine, you know, or airy spring sanguine, cancer, you know, summer, blah, blah, blah. Spring sanguine, Taurus, beautiful. Well done, Natalie. Aquarius, winter, phlegmatic, fantastic, Diana. Libra, autumn, okay, I see a summer choleric, Leo ascendant, summer choleric, Libra, autumn, melancholic, beautiful. All right, now what I want you to do, that same sign, all right, I want you to tell me what that particular, I'm going to actually change the, hold on a second, yes, that same sign, okay, now noticing the temperament of the signs, now we're not talking about season, what element is it and what is the temperament of that element so you who have a libra ascendant what element is libra and what temperament is what temperament is libra because you're going to mix them right because you've got now you've got an autumn sign that's melancholic with a a libra air sign which is sanguine there's a mixture this is the mixture he's talking about I've got a summer choleric sign. Okay, what's that new message saying? Taurus, cold, dry temperament. Okay, so Taurus was in a cold, it itself is in a cold, dry temperament, but it's in spring, which is in us. What is spring? The sanguine? Oh. Yeah, hot, wet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so do you see? So you see once again, it's all of this ability, the ability to combine stuff. To combine significators is what makes a good astro a great astrologer, right? So do not and, and the thing is you have to get you have to practice it. You 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 know you just kind of have to practice it and get good at it. So don't shirk away from oh wait the the, the significators are mixed or how do you combine? Just kind of get in there. So we've got a hot and dry with a hot and wet. Or we've got a cold and dry with a blah, blah. So, so someone has an earth cold, dry Virgo, but we also know that that's, oh, and it's doubly, right? Because it's fall, which is also cold, dry. So once again, we get, so be thinking about it. Now, I want you to do the same thing with the ruler of the ascendant. Now do the same thing with the ruler of the ascendant. So it's the planet that rules the ascendant. If it's Libra, it's Venus. If it's Virgo, it's Mercury. If it's Taurus, it's Venus. If, you, you know what I'm saying? So do the same thing, starting first with the season. What season? Okay, so we're looking at the planet that rules the ascendant, the sign that that planet occupies, and what season is represented. So for me, my ruler of the ascendant, my ascendant is Sagittarius, which is in the fall, and it is also a hot and dry sign. Then the ruler of Sagittarius is Jupiter. Jupiter is in Gemini. Gemini is a spring sign, right? Is a spring sign, and it is a hot and wet sign. <clears throat> so that's how we're going. <clears throat> so once again, so we're going to do that with both. So we do it with the ascendant. And we do it with the ruler of the ascendant. So go ahead and put that in your in the chat too. So now we're looking for the ruler of the ascendant. My chart ruler is in Aries, okay? It stays the same as my Taurus ascendant, but spring, sanguine, hot and wet. Excellent. All the, okay, autumn, Libra, Venus, and Scorpio, also autumn. Fantastic. <laughs> and, uh, the, uh, the person that has the uh, chart ruler in, oh, it was Natalie. Natalie, your chart ruler in Aries, um, is that Venus? Yeah, it's Venus in the 12th house. That's what I thought, because I, 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 I remember from your chart. Okay, excellent. 
Okay, anybody anybody else want to anybody having a problem? Amy, Kimmy, um anybody anybody having a problem understanding what I'm uh, figuring it out? Cuz I only have two people that have answered. Okay, so while you all, if you if you have a problem, obviously put it in the chat. While you're doing that, let's move on. And now let's look at the temperament of the planets themselves. So temperaments of the planet. Saturn is cold and dry. Jupiter is warm and wet. Mars is hot and dry. The sun is hot and dry. Venus is warm and wet. Mercury is cold and dry. And the moon is cold and wet. <clears throat> so there are ways that planets can be strengthened. A planet is strengthened, obviously, when he's in the sign of his own domicile or exaltation, right? But a planet can also be strengthened by being in a sign that's similar to its nature. So, for instance, Saturn is a cold and dry planet, but there are also cold and dry signs. The cold and dry signs are Taurus, Virgo, and Capricorn. Now, Saturn rules Capricorn, but Virgo and Taurus are also cold and dry. So that means that when Saturn is in those signs, he responds kind of well to them because they are signs that are similar to his nature. If he were, okay, it looks like I have a question here. So Saturn, cold, dry, in Aquarius, winter, phlegmatic, hot and wet. Yes, and it's also a hot and wet, or it's a cold and wet, winter is cold and wet, and then, oh, I see, you see, I see what you said here, phlegmatic slash hot wet. Exactly. Now, the thing is, Saturn rules Aquarius, and he is also called the ruler of air or the father of air. So that's one of the things, and if, if those of you who've been with me, you know that he's also the daytime ruler of the air triplicity. So Saturn is really very much connected to the air element. So for those of you who are new, that's some new information about Saturn. And it's only connected to uh, traditional astrology. It's not connected to modern astrology at all. But Saturn is the father of air um, because he owns Aquarius. Matter of fact, that's the sign of his joy. And he's exalted in Libra, which is another air sign, right? So he's he's actually has quite a bit of authority in air. Yes. So that's, so Diana, this thing about I've got this cold, dry planet in this hot and wet sign that's in a cold and wet season, right? That's the admixture that they're talking about. And that's what turns us, this ability or this um, learning how to mix is, this, uh, is the thing that turns us into good astrologers. All right. So uh, did I go oh, Venus, warm and wet? And so the same thing, Mars and the sun, hot and dry, the hot, dry signs are Aries, Leo, and Sagittarius. Mars rules Aries, Sun rules Leo, right? And they, so that means that when both of them are in Sagittarius, they're kind of happy. When Mars is in Leo, he's kind of happy. He's okay. It's not, his, it's not the sign that he rules or where he's exalted. Sun is exalted in Aries. But he doesn't mind because it's a hot sign like him. He doesn't have to be something totally different. So this is where, um, for those of you who don't know the term peregrine, this is where that term comes from. The term per or this idea of peregrine really comes from. It's that when you have a planet like Mars and he's in a sign like Aquarius, Aquarius is, or he's in a sign like, uh, yeah, he's in a sign like Aquarius. That sign isn't really that conducive to him. Not only does he not rule it, but it's not even really that conducive because he's hot and dry and it's a wet sign and it's not really that hot. So this is when we, so this is how we understand that not all placements are really equal. And now we start to understand why, you know, a sun in a hot and dry sign, if he's in a cold, wet, if he's in a cold, wet sign like Pisces, the sun, then he can't really be himself. Or he's going to be himself in the best way that he can, working in this new element that he really doesn't understand, this new and this temperament that he really doesn't have a lot of um, experience with. So just so so those of you who have a sun and a water sign, think about that. You know, a hot and dry planet is in a cold and wet sign. Same thing with Mars, except that Mars rules Scorpio, which is hot, cold and wet. See, so we can just kind of go on and on and on and on 
with this um, if we when we really think about it. But now you now you've got some strong foundation, and we can once again we can bring this to charts. And here's a a, a chart itself that kind of looks at this. Um, and so oh okay. So remember, we're going to talk about diurnal and nocturnal and all that stuff. So there are diurnal or daytime planets. There are nocturnal and nighttime planets. The daytime planets are obviously the sun, who's the light of the day, then Jupiter and Saturn. The nighttime planets are the moon, who's the, night, the night light, and then Mars and Venus. Mercury is mixed, right? He becomes di diurnal with the diurnal planets and nocturnal with the nocturnal planets. All right, so that's probably new information for some of you. And then our masculine and feminine. So obviously Saturn, Jupiter, Mars, and the sun are masculine planets, and Venus and the moon are feminine planets, and the hermaphrodite is Mercury. He's the mixed planet. Okay, so it becomes female with female, male with male. Then we have our temperaments, cold and dry, hot and moist, hot and dry, Temperately hot and dry, temperately cold and moist. Cold. Now, I I've heard hot and like temperately warm and moist. But these these two are actually more similar. Um, cold and dry and cold and moist. But I'm not going to say it's wrong. Uh, then Saturn. Okay, so Sat notice these elements here for the planets. Saturn it says this because Saturn is the significator for things under the Earth, um, and so for mines, gardens. Uh, you, you know, agriculture. Saturn is the, the, the traditional um, significant for agriculture and growth from the earth. Remember, he rules Capricorn. Now, it's interesting, he's earthy when we call him the father of air. Jupiter represents the north wind. So that's why he's the air. Mars, obviously, is fire. Um, although this, and because, oh, Mars and the sun are hot and dry. Mars is the hot and dry principle of fire as heat. And the sun is the principle of fire as light. She's airy watery. Mercury is water. Isn't that interesting? Watery, right? We would, we would generally think of Mercury as airy. And some actually would even think of him as, in uh, Vedic astrology, he's given to the earth, earth um, element. So I think that's very interesting. All right. So, and then, oh, look, he's the author of Solitariness, which we've talked about before. Jupiter of temper, Temperance. Mars is the author of Quarrels and Strife. Mirth and jollity for Venus, for Venus, and subtlety and tricks for Mercury. All right. Okay, the fixed stars assist in poker to deformity, um, but we're not going to look at that. Either Mercury or Venus being in their houses or exaltation, beholding the ascendant. Now, when he's saying beholding, he means aspecting it, right? Do argue a tall stature. Okay, so Mercury or Venus be in, in their house or exaltation. So they either need to be in the signs that they own or in the signs of their exaltation, um, they do argue a tall stature. And contrary, when they are in their falls and detriment. So that's interesting. Now, this is from Lily. <clears throat> One of the reasons I used Lily is because, as a matter of fact, I used all of these guys, is because all of these guys were practicing astrologers of their time. And Lily was working all the time, looking at charts all the time, doing horary questions all the time. And... Uh, so was Bonatti, but Lily, Lily basically almost gave us his notebook and you know his diary and and method of everything and um and so I used Lily because he was hands on the ground, he was feet on the ground rather, um and working with things and making things you know figuring out what worked and thinking figuring out what didn't work. So I really do kind of take him, you know, he's a little later than I like to focus, but um I I do really take him very seriously and I think that he. Being a practicing astrologer really knew what he was doing and really has a lot to offer us. So we will be looking for when Venus or Mercury is in their own house or exaltation and they're aspecting the ascendant. Saturn, Jupiter, or Mars in their fall, detriment, or retrograde do declare a middle stature, <clears throat> yet tending to brevity. Now, I've got Jupiter, detriment, and retrograde, and I have kind of a middle stature. I'm five foot ten. I guess that would be that would be kind of middling tall. So um, that would tending to brevity, brevity meaning shortness. Um, but I'm probably towards I'm more towards tallness. But I definitely have a middle stature. But if they be in their falls or detriment and not retrograde, they vary not the statue. So retrogradation 
makes the, we just saw earlier where they thought retro, retrogradation makes people fat. Now they're saying they think retrogradation inclines you towards shortness. So that's interesting. If no planet do partially behold the Lord of the Ascendant, then judgment must be derived from the Lord of the Ascendant, the sign he is in, not considered if he be direct. Let me see this again. If no planet do partially behold the Lord of the Ascendant, then judgment must be derived from the Lord of the Ascendant, the sign he is in, not considered if he be direct. That's interesting. The sign. Oh, I see. So what they're saying is that it wouldn't be that the admixture. Now I don't. I don't agree with that. I will. Now we'll see if that's right or not. He's basically saying don't bother with what the sign is that the Lord of the Ascendant is in if there's no aspect being made to him. And I don't necessarily agree with that. Although I could see how if there is an aspect being made to the Lord of the Ascendant, especially from the ruler of the sign the Lord of the Ascendant is in, that it would be quite important. Okay, so this might have something to do with some of the things that we've looked at around reception. He, if he, meaning the Lord of the Ascendant, is in his retrograde or his fall, then we judge not of the stature according to the nature of the planet, but sign wherein he is. Oh, ho, ho. Okay. That's interesting. So, the rule that he's saying is, if, if the planet... Wow. That's really fascinating. If there's no aspect to the Lord of the Ascendant, look only at the planet and not the sign. If the Lord of the Ascendant is retrograde and in fall or detriment, then we judge not the stature based on the planet, but on the sign. And I just want to bring your attention to me and to Layla. Layla and I both have Jupiter in signs ruled by Mercury. We both look way younger. In her case, she sounds like a teenager, even though she's almost almost 30. I look, I sometimes, especially now when I don't have any, any I'm going to be 56, but I can look as young as 35 when I, when I shave everything off. And it's the Mercury as ruler of Gemini, and in her case, in the ruler of Virgo. So this, that actually does make a little bit of sense if I use my own chart as kind of a litmus. And we'll look at some other charts in a second. But that's very interesting. If a planet is in retrograde and in its fall, don't use the stature of the planet. Use the sign. <clears throat> After the same manner, the luminaries having power, dignity in the horoscope do discover the statue according to the quality of the sign which they possess. But Mercury having dominion in the ascendant gives the stature according to the nature of the planet who is his dispositor. Okay, now this makes sense. Okay, well, I'm sure I'm, I'm, I've confused people. Someone, oh, ha, someone bet her that she couldn't be older than 23 uh, uh, the other day. And yeah, definitely. And you know, when I'm on, I'm, I'm on these, you know, dating sites and telling people I'm 43 and nobody says a, a thing, you know, and <clears throat> I mean, I have been able to get away with 38, 39. Um, I just did 43 because I felt guilty. All right. So <laughs> let me see what that, la those last two sentences said again. Uh, luminaries having power and dignity in the horoscope. Okay. So if the, okay, so that's an important thing. We look at the luminaries, but we look at them only if they have dignity in the horoscope. That means if Cancer is rising or Taurus is rising, so you who have Taurus rising, the moon has dignity in the horoscope. And so the moon can participate in your physicality. Um, if, if you've got Aries rising, the moon is, then the sun is participating. It, is, it has dignity in, the, in that horoscope and the sun can participate. So that's what this is saying. If, if do discover the stature according to the quality of the sign. So you who have um, Taurus rising, I know we've got somebody in here who does. You who have Taurus rising, then what they're saying is, look at the sign that the moon is. The sign that the moon is will give you an idea about your physicality. And we're, and we're going to go into, in a second, what are the actual physical things of the moon, of, the, of, the, the, of all the planets and signs. If Mercury has dominion in the ascendant, so if you've got Gemini or Virgo rising, give the stature according to the nature of the planet who is his dispositor. Then it says, give the nature of the planet who rules your Mercury. So if, if, if you have Gemini or, Vir, or Virgo rising, would you please put your, um, just kind of say hi in the chat for me, because that's interesting. So we've got a few very interesting rules here that we're going to see if they work or not. 
First, it's that we're looking for the Venus and Mercury in a house or exaltation in any kind of aspect to the ascendant. Then we're looking to see if Saturn or Jupiter or Mars are in their fall. We got somebody with Gemini rising. Virgo, Virgo rising, Sarah. Virgo rising. Only if we're talking about Virgo rising. Yes, thank you. <clears throat> okay, so in that case, what he is saying is that you look for the stature of the planet who rules your Mercury. So what sign is your Mercury in? And then let's continue with what we were talking about. So the fall detriment of retrograde middle stature for the Saturn, Jupiter, or Mars. And then if they're being in their fall or detriment and not retrograde, it doesn't vary the stature. And then we're looking to see if there's an aspect being made to the Lord of the Ascendant, because if there isn't, we only look at the, the planet and not the sign. And if the Lord of the Ascendant is retrograde and in fall, or in his fall, or and in his fall, then we judge not the stature, but, we, but according to only the sign. Leo. So we would look for the sun. So basically, we would look for the sun to primarily give you your physicality based on what Lily says. All right. And so let's... Let's now move on. Oh, to stout and lean. Okay. See, there's so much stuff. On some level, let's just, can we just kind of do this really quickly? Look at that. Aries, Taurus, Leo. The first part declares grossness. First part meaning to up to 15 degrees. Latter lean. Now we're just seeing if this is right or not. Gemini, Scorpio. First sign lean, latter gross. First part, uh, so Cancer Capricorn, first part mediocrity, so me, me, uh, middle, me, you know, medium, um, latter gross. Sagittarius, first part lean, latter gross. Aquarius, first, uh, Aquarius, Pisces, Libra, Virgo, shows a moderate proportion of bodies, but the latter part of Aquarius declines to leanness. Lord of Ascendant is, is this oh so the Lord of the Ascendant is this considered if he behold the degree ascending partially take your judgment according to the nature of the sign ascending if it be not so see see how how hard this is this is not easy this is not straightforward this is probably why I didn't include it I mean I didn't even look at it was probably why I didn't even look at it look at all these rules <laughs> I mean look at that. If the, so what he's saying is if the Lord of the Ascendant is aspecting the Ascendant, then you take the judgment primarily from the sign ascending. If not, then receive judgment according to the quality of the sign of the Lord of the Ascendant is in. Wow. So that he be in any respect with the planet. Okay, if the Lord of the Ascendant is behold by no par by planet partially or partially. Oh, par he didn't mean partially. He meant partile. Ah, oh, we've been looking at that that word and thinking part partial, but it's actually partile, which means something different. Partile means exact. Uh, so if there's nothing exact, where did we see that before? I don't know. Judge by that mediety of the sign, which the uh, mutant doth not occupy or of. I mean, look at how hard this is. Lord of the house or exaltation of the horoscope joined to the sun within the mighty of orbs pertains to a great body. So I'm wondering if there's a way that I can kind of uh, encapsulate what I'm looking at. It looks like, what, there are things that obviously can't be. Like, we just need to know first part of Aries, Taurus, and Leo is big. The latter part is lean, right? It's, and et cetera, et cetera. But these other things, those things need to be kind of looked at and worked with kind of continuously. But it looks like when a planet is aspecting the ascendant, if the ruler of the ascendant is aspecting the ascendant, it strengthens the ascendant so that the ascendant can be one of the main significators for the body. I think that's why he's saying that one. If the ascendant is hold, beholding no planet, judge by the sign that the, that the planet is in, that the, right, which the all mutant doth not occupy or possess. What? I, 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 I thought that was originally what we saw before. If the Lord of the Ascendant is beheld by no planet partially, judged by that mediety of the sign which the Almutant doth not occupy or possess. I have no idea what that means. 
the Lord of the house or exaltation joined to the sun makes, okay, that makes big bodies. Okay, so the Lord of the house or the exaltation of the horoscope, you know, the ruler or the exaltation ruler of the ascendant combust, it makes the body big. So that's interesting. If two planets have equal dominion in the horoscope, you would take him who is the closest to the aspect. So partile means exact. So you're taking, so he says, whichever one, if there's more than one, you use the planet who is the closest. Okay, now we finally come to the physical sign, the physical uh, forms of the planets and signs. We may need to, <clears throat> we might need to, I mean, it almost looks like we might need to break it up even further and kind of go into, I want to, you know, and I'm going to do that. I'm going to break it up another for another second. Because what I want to do is it feels like we need to kind of look at what we were just talking about with something. Okay, so we're just talking about is Venus or Mercury exalted or in their own sign? No. Okay. First of all, is there a planet that's aspecting the ascendant? The ascendant is at 27 degrees. Mars is sextiling the ascendant. So we know from we know from what we just read that a planet aspecting the ascendant will give some of its nature to the ascendant as far as tallness or or shortness or stature and we also see here <clears throat> that Mars is exalted. So let's just do one thing at a time. Let's look at this Mars exalted aspecting the ascendant and let's go back to the presentation and look at the Mars body. And we come down here to corporature. Generally, martialists have this form. They are but middle stature, their bodies strong, and their bones big, rather lean than fat, their complexion of a brown ready color. We're not, the coloring, all of this coloring thing, I mean, there's so many people of so many different complexions, I don't think we should be taking that into account. But I like what I do like about this is middle stature, body strong and bones big, lean rather than fat, visage round, hair red. Now remember, Mars rules red, so that's where this red hair comes from, or the kind of the red or the ginger type of personality. But that we're not using that. And many times crisping or curly, sharp hazel eyes. Remember, Scorpio tends to have piercing eyes, so the sharp eyes a bold, confident countenance that we're talking about. Now we're talking about manner. And that's a different thing as well. And that's something I wanted to bring up. But I don't know if I have the time. And, or maybe that's what we should be looking at next week, is we should be looking at manner. Because today we're looking at body. But as you can see, I included stuff about manner. Because the three, the three things that the Ascendant is known for are corpus, which is body, vita, which is life, and ingenium, which is talent, wit, ingenuity. And so, it, because remember, the first house or the ascendant represents the head. And so it is your mind, and it's your skill or talent. And that's also proven by the fact that Mercury is in its joy in the first house, and Mercury represents skill. So, it, it says not just the so the planet we're looking we're looking only at at the physicality today, but it's not just telling you who what you look like. It's also telling you your manner. So when you look at the planet that rules your ascendant, so you who has the Virgo ascendant, you're when you look at your Virgo ascendant, you're looking at Mercury, and and it's going to Mercury is going to give you hints. As to your physicality, or in this case, we now know that the planet that rules Mercury is going to give hints, and it's going to give hints as to what kind of person you are, because each planet has its own manner. And we can see from here, Mercury's manner is courage, invincible, scorning any should exceed him, subject to no reason, not reason, so acts before they think. Bold, confident, immovable. So not only are you going to show this Mars body, but you're going to show this Mars manner. Same thing if you've got Taurus rising. 
We've got somebody who's got the double, double Virgo with Taurus rising. You're going to show the Venus manner because Venus rules Taurus. You're not, I mean, Venus is beauty, so we might expect you to be physically attractive because Venus is, is, is represents beauty. But we also know that you might like art and uh, music or things of that nature because that's part of her manner. <clears throat> so when we talk about, so we can't fully separate manner from corporature because they're all part of the first house they're all part of how we present to the world okay let's go back to the chart so from that and also we we just read about pisces being a short sign we just read about planets in retrograde sign in retrograde, this is the ruler of the chart, retrograde, pe taking people towards fatness. What, what did it say about what part of Pisces? <clears throat> Aquarius, Pisces, Libra shows a moderate proportion of body, so a moderate proportion of body, but the latter part of Aquarius inclines towards leanness. So this Pisces should be so I would say this is kind of a moderate shape. They might have an ability to kind of put on weight because obviously the water signs have, an have a tendency to sometimes put on weight. Um, Taurus, Cancer, Scorpio, and Pisces show deformity. So the latter part, so do the, so there might also be a part, there might be some crookedness in the, in the stature. Now Jupiter is about, so let's, oh, let's, Jupiter is the ruler of the ascendant. So let's look and see what the Jupiter body looks like. Hold on. Okay, so Jupiter's the ruler of the ascendant, right? Pisces is the is on the ascendant. Jupiter rules it. When Jupiter is okay, wait, a corporature. Upright, straight, and tall stature. Brown and ruddy, lovely complexion of oval, blah, 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 blah. Of oval or long visage. Okay, so that's important. Oval or long. So to see if that if that actually uh, pans out. So upright, straight, and tall. Oval or long, full or fleshy, high forehead, large, great, with the color of the eyes, obviously, hair soft, kind of a blah, 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 large, deep belly, of course, because Jupiter was, was usually shown with a large belly, strong proportion thighs and legs, because Sagittarius rules the thighs, feet long, Pisces rules the feet, being the most indecent parts of his whole body, oh, I wonder what that means, being in the most decent parts of the whole, in his speech, he is sober, and of grave discourse. Okay, once again, we're coming back to manner. Now, let's move forward for a second and look at what Pisces represents. Jupiter signs, Pisces, a short stature, ill-composed, not very decent, a good large face, palish complexion, the body fleshy or swelling, not very straight. But incurvating something, remember, just said straight and large, right? So this is all of the admixtures. Now, what if we went and looked at Capricorn, right? Because we saw that Mars was in Capricorn. Oh. There we, uh, wait. There we go. Capricorn, dry bodies, not high of stature, long, lean, and slender visage, black hair or narrow chin, long, small neck, narrow breasts. Many times Capricorn is sending the party to have white hair, but in the seventh they were black. I can see the white and blah, blah, blah. Okay. The reason I'm, at, I'm, I'm doing this is because there's just enough things that come up that give us an idea. One is this person should not be overly tall. Right? Pisces is a short sign. We've already, the things that we've just looked at have pretty much said this person will be at the very most of a middling stature. I would say this person is no taller than 5'7", no taller than 5'8". <clears throat> I would think maybe if this is a female, nanny in heels, it's a female. I think that this might be a curvier. Oh, wait, maybe not. Because look, the Mercury is in Virgo, right? So I mean, the moon rather is in Virgo. So maybe not. So maybe not so curvy. Maybe more, a little bit more androgynous. Right now, the, we're, I'm just kind of winging it myself. I'm not using Lily's rules specifically, but remember how we already talked about this chart and about the uh, about the problem 
in the, you know, about the problem in this chart with the, the war. Um, and so I think that that also takes us away from the physical, some of the physical manifestations of the body, which we would think might be kind of short and curvy. And I think maybe this might make the person a little, a little bit more straight and androgynous looking, just a tiny bit more straight and androgynous looking. Um, what I'd like for everybody to do, because I'm, I, like I said, I, like I said in my original uh, blurb about the, the workshop, I've got these charts to look at, but I would also love to look at your charts too. So if you want me to look at your chart, this is what you need to do. You, you should go to astro.com and download your chart from astro.com. Preferably in Alcabish's houses, you don't, but in Placidus is fine. And then once you get that, then you need to upload that to imgur.com. imgur.com is an uploading service for, for photos. And then send me the imgur link that you that you use to upload that um, that has your picture and then I'll upload that picture of uh, the picture of your chart and we can look at it that way. Um, everybody that's been with me for a while has knows that knows about it, but you knew people. So the first thing you're going to do is go to astro.com. You're going to make a chart, hopefully with Alcabicious, but Placidus is fine. And then you're going to upload that chart to imgur.com. OK. So in the meanwhile, I'm going to go to other of my charts and start working. Thank you. Thank you, Natalie. Wonderful. <clears throat> okay. All right. So this is Delmar 78. And so first of all, let's just kind of start with what we've been, what we've learned so far. The season of Libra is fall, which puts us in a melancholic temperament. Libra itself is sanguine, right? So we've got a, a melancholic sanguine connection here. Sanguine, which means that this conversational, even keel, that's, this is this even keel thing about sanguinity is one of the reasons that Libra hates conflict. Right. The other reason it hates conflict is because it's a Venus ruled sign and the Venus signs are opposite the Mars sign and Mars signs are all about Mars is the is the author of conflict and Venus is the author of harmony and mirth and enjoyment. <clears throat> so she doesn't like conflict. So that's why Libra avoids conflict. But the sanguinity is an aspect aspect of it as well. So where is Venus? Now, this Venus is also in a an autumn sign but she's in a cold and wet so we've got warm and wet and cold and wet warm and wet and cold and wet <clears throat> so this person <clears throat> even though we know that <clears throat> excuse me <clears throat> scorpio is the scorpio is the detriment of venus this person should probably be very good at expressing their emotions or expressing their internal feelings um they would be selective about it obviously because it's scorpio and they'd have to trust you and all that stuff but they would be probably very good at it right because of the sanguinity of the ascendant and, and it would you know, and they might even do it to they might, might even be able to weaponize it right because scorpio is ruled by mars um and so if this person matter of fact that might be a problem in relationships for this person so once again, so see, I'm, I'm, I'm going into the temperament, which brings us into manner. And then we can go to body in a second, right? So that can, <clears throat> so that this aspect of Venus being in her detriment, so she doesn't get to act like herself, right? She doesn't get to act like her. She has to act like Mars, who's in Capricorn, another Mars in Capricorn. This is the second chart we looked at, Mars in Capricorn. So this hot and dry planet in a cold, dry, in a cold, dry sign is ruling this moderate wet planet in a cold wet sign. And that sign is ruling that ascendant. This is how astrology works. It's this linkage of rulership after rulership that ends up kind of creating this. So we've walked into the temperament a little bit. We know that it's a sanguine temperament at first. Then we also know that the Venus is in a phlegmatic way so and but we also know that the way that scorpio does phlegmatic is different right scorpio doesn't do phlegmatic the same way that pisces and cancer do 
right? Cancer and Pisces will cry in a bit in a minute. C- cancer and Pisces will Pisces will <laughs> Pisces. Thank you. Uh, okay. Cancer and Pisces will uh, will are are kind of ruled by their emotions and, or, or, or or and led by them. And we can say that too by Scorpio, except what I would say by Scorpio is that Scorpio is led, Scorpio's agenda is led by its need to protect itself emotionally. And so that's what we get here is this sanguinity, the sanguinity versus this protectiveness of this Venus. Now, what, oh, we've got the Jupiter sextile. And so Jupiter would make things bigger, taller, straighter, right? Jupiter's in Leo. And then we've got the Venus, she's in detriment. And, oh, and we have the Jupiter Venus. Now it's not an, a, a, applying. And I think that more than likely, even though he hasn't really said it, he would want this to be applying. So for you new people, aspects can apply or separate. And the, how you know if they are applying or separate is that a fast, there are fast planets and slow planets. From the, begin, from the slowest to the fastest, Saturn, Jupiter, Mars, Sun, Venus, Mercury, Moon. <clears throat> okay? <clears throat> Only faster planets can apply to slower planets. If a faster planet is, apply, is in an aspect to a slower planet, and, and by the way, all of this is once again in my medieval astrology course in not just looking at aspects, but working with aspects. I did two classes to it because we needed quite a bit of time on it. Um, so there's quite a bit that goes into kind of being able to identify our aspects. But what I want, the fastest planet here is the moon. Okay, so she's the very fastest planet. The moon is at 19 degrees of Gemini. Gemini regards or aspects Leo, Virgo, Libra, and Sagittarius, Aries, Pisces, and Aquarius. Okay? If the moon is, a, if the moon is a t- touching any planet <clears throat> that's at a higher degree than 19, then she is applying. In this particular case, the sun is at 21 degrees of Sagittarius. The, and once again, Gemini does aspect Sagittarius, so that means that the moon is applying to the opposition of the sun, meaning that this is a full moon chart, and the moon, the moon is applying because she's at 19 and the sun is at 21. So that's basically what, when, when, a, when they say, hey, if there's an aspect between blah, 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 they usually mean applying. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Dinah. They usually mean applying. They usually don't mean <clears throat> just anything. They usually want an applying aspect. So is the ruler of the ascendant in an applying aspect with anybody? She's at 11. And it looks like the answer is yes. Venus is applying to the aspect of Saturn. So what they said is if Venus is an aspect, if the ruler of the ascendant is an aspect, then you would look only at the planet, right? You would look only at the planet. Isn't that what it said? Let me check it. Yeah, wait, so if the Lord of the ascendant is beheld by no planet. Okay, no planet. Okay, so, okay, fine. So I think what he is actually saying is then what we need to look at is the con- the mixture of Venus and Saturn and Libra and oh ah sorry one second sorry sorry sorry. There we go. Okay, so what we're going to look up now then is Libra, Venus, Scorpio, Saturn, and Virgo, right? That's Those are the most germane. The moon is in Gemini. Ah, look at that. And the moon's in Gemini. So that gives us some little bit more Mercury con- connection with the two. <clears throat> All right, let's look, at, let's look and see what it says. So let's go to Libra first. Libra, well-framed body, straight, tall, more subtle or slender than gross. 
round, lovely, and beautiful visage, a pure sanguine color. Sanguine, there's that word. In youth, no abundance or excess in either white or red. Okay, the colors. But in age, usually some pimples or a very high color. The hair yellow is smooth and long. But this part is important. The well-framed body, straight, tall, more subtle or slender um, than gross, round, lovely, and beautiful visage. Okay? Pure sanguine color. Then we go to Scorpio. Corpulent, strong, able body, somewhat broad or square face, dusky, muddy complexion, sad, dark hair, crisping, somewhat bow-legged. Oh, wow. So she said Taurus was exactly her. <laughs> That's great. Well, we're going to come to it. We're going to come to it in a second. Okay. Oops. And then what's the next thing we were looking at is, uh, oh, Venus. So we're looking at the, the what Venus looks like. All right. A man of fair but not tall stature, complexion being white, tending to a little darkness, which makes him more lovely. Very fair, lovely eyes and a little black, a round face and not large, fair hair, smooth and plenty of it, and usually of a light brown color, lovely mouth and cherry lips. Remember, Venus is beauty and exceedingly well-shaped, one desirous of trimming and making himself neat. And now we get into manner and complete both in clothes and body, a love dimple in his cheeks and steadfast eye and full of amorous enticements. All right. So <clears throat> that's what we would kind of expect to see for that. Now, let's see what Saturn because remember, she's connected with Saturn, and she's in the sign of Mars. You must observe a cell, blah, blah. most of the part of the body cold and dry, middle stature. So we're back with this middle stature. Complexion, swarthy, swarthy and middleish, muddy as eyes, little black, blah, 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 a broad forehead, hard and rugged, great ears, hanging lower eyebrows, thick lips, no, nose, a rare or thin beard, lumpish and pleasant countenance either holding his head forward or stooping. Oh, because there's a stooping aspect to Saturn. Shoulders broad and large, many times crooked, belly somewhat short and lank, thighs spare, lean and not long. Saturn was usually seen, seen to be very, very thin, very thin and you know skinny and thin, like emaciated thin. Let's go back to the chart and see what we think. So, the, so what I think is that the Venus with the Saturn is more about the matter than the, than the body. And I, but but what I do think is interesting is that Libra is rising, but Venus is in the sign of her de detriment, and she's applying to a planet in the sign of her fall. So that this Venus is not going to be, I don't think this Venus is going to look like a typical Venus. Now, mind you, the typical Venus looked more like a Venus de Milo, right? A voluptuous, voluptuous, curvy is what we would be thinking would be we'd be thinking traditional Venus, not twiggy model Venus like we would think now. Right. And, but I think that that would be more the case. I think this person is not particularly tall. I think this person is probably even though Libra is rising, I don't think this person is overly beautiful or, or overly physically attractive, nor do I think I think the person is aesthetic, but not aesthetic in a way that is about traditional beauty. And I think that this person might not be traditionally beautiful. I think this person might be a little bit on the dark side and have very piercing eyes. Um, also might be inclined towards melancholy, be inclined towards depression and melancholy and seriousness because of the sextile to Saturn. I, once again, I think that Saturn shows us more in the manner than it shows in the physical person. Um, and also note that Mars, the ruler of Scorpio, is in a Saturn sign. So I think that, so it might indeed br bring the physicality, bring it into it a little bit more physically, since it is affecting it on the Mars, in the Mars way. The other reason I think that this person might not be voluptuous, curvy, is because the moon's in Gemini. So the moon is in Gemini, Mercury's in Sagittarius. So yeah, these are, you know, masculine signs. Um, that are uh, and that are known for being kind of tall and straight, long and straight. So I just thought that'll be the. So we're, we're going to stop with the samples for a second, and I'm going to come back. I'm going to come to ours and look at that. We'll start with Natalie. Okay, waiting for you to come up. All right, everybody see? <clears throat> okay. So, 
We've already started with Taurus rising. Taurus is rising, which gives us a melancholic sign on, as an earth sign, but it's also spring, which gives us a sanguine season. So there's a melancholic sanguine already. There's a melancholic sanguine aspect to this person. So this person can get go into the uh, the pessimism of the melancholy, but not. It can go back and forth between the two. The Venus is in Aries, the 12th, or at the cusp of the 12th. So the Venus is choleric, even though she's this is also a spring sign. So we've got a choleric, a choleric sanguine connection for the Venus. So this this I, I find interesting. I find also look at how many other planets are in, look at how all these planets are in Gemini here. And two of the planets are in the first. So she's got planets in the first. She's got, and this is an example of what I was talking about. She's got late degrees of Taurus rising, which means that early degrees of Gemini, planets at early degrees of Gemini are in the ascendant. So ultimately the sun would have a little bit of something to do with this. What I tend to find with the sun in the ascendant is that people tend to be very connected to their vitality, very connected to their health, trying to stay healthy, trying to stay vital. I have this. Um, <clears throat> I find a lot of people who have done yoga teacher trainings have <laughs> sun in the ascendant. <clears throat> yoga and sun in the first. I see that quite often. I don't know, Natalie, if you're involved with yoga, but if you're not, you might think about it because sun in the first for yoga is good, is a good thing. Um, now, one of the things that seeing this connection of sanguine, sanguine, uh, let's see, what did she say? She practices it on and off. Okay, so one of the things I, I see with this thing with sanguine melancholy and sanguine cho cholera is that sanguine in anything means that I put into words what's going on. And also, though, that it can cool down what's going on. So I don't get too melancholy. I don't get too hot and fiery, and in the, and in both cases, it's because I know how to discharge it verbally, right? Because the sanguine is really about the verbal, because it's the human signs, and we can speak. So, and and the thing for me that kind of con, uh, confirms that is this stuff here. Remember when we talked about locating the soul? Moon and Mercury are the primary rulers of that. Mercury is in Gemini. Moon is in Gemini. Sun, both, remember, lights are one of the things we look at, too. Both lights are in Gemini. So that might have a little bit to do with the physicality. Is there a connection between Venus and these lights? There, the, the Mercury is applying to the Venus. Ah, someone says, okay, someone here said that... Um, they have a roommate with sun in the first, and they are super dedicated to their yoga practice. Yeah, I tend to find it quite often, sun in the first. Um, so you might find later on that you, you have like a yoga moment. You have like a, 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 like a yoga epiphany, Natalie. Um, but so this probably involves, obviously involves the manner, but notice how the Mercury is applying to the Venus. So I would say, there, I wonder if Natalie went through a tomboy period or a period where you know, a boy, like a like if she might have been even like a late starter with puberty, where she went through a boyish like or or a boyishness or an androgynous phase, because there is an androgyny in this chart as a result of all of this Mercury and the connection with the Venus. Does any of that any of that chart, um, Natalie? Oh, she's having it now. <laughs> she says she's having the phase now. There, yeah, so there. Okay, now that's this is an important thing about the Mercury signs, and especially about Mercury and Gemini, Mercury and Virgo. But Mercury in the first, or Mercury in his own signs. Remember, Mercury is gender neutral. Mercury is gender neutral. Now he's he is with the Sun here, so we can say that he's primarily acting as a man, that he's acting male, right? He's in a male sign. He's in he's in a male sign with a male planet. So we can primarily say that that's kind of happening. And so one of the things you're going to want to look at in your own charts is what's going on with my Mercury and how much does it confirm or affirm my gender stance? 
And so in this particular case, there should be ambiguity in the gender stance because you've got the Venus in Aries. Venus is a female planet. She's in a masculine sign ruled by a masculine planet. Even when I was less tomboy, though, I would wear male fashion in a feminine way. So waistcoats and suit pants, etc. Male fashions in a feminine way is Venus. Remember, uh, I've read for Natalie, and I think, um, I'm sure I used this term with her. I call Venus in Aries the Amazon Venus. This is our warrior Venus. And so wearing masculine clothes in a feminine way is Venus in Aries. Perfect. So once, So this chart, one of the things about this chart is the gender ambiguity or is the ability for it to go back and forth and she's it doesn't start you know you don't start always being fully comfortable with it you know it's something that over time you one learns but there should be an androgyny to this in, in the physicality um so that she might not want so the same thing with people that she is attracted to she may not find herself um, enjoying being in relationships with men who are too masculine men who are too um alpha because first of all venus and aries is alpha and then this this thing isn't really fully this thing isn't really fully interested in being a little woman this chart is not interested in being anybody's little woman and so um, and other charts would be right. So um, so we didn't get fully. Oh, physicality. So what does this person look like? Um, I would say there's a broadness to this person's look because Mars is ruling the ascendant, the ruler, the ruler of the ascendant. There's a separating trine. There's a separating trine with Mars. So it's already happened. Um, this person might be a little bit of a hair diva because the Leo <clears throat> because of the Mars is in Leo. Um, I, uh, once again, I think the lean and straight, maybe not, maybe not super big chest, um, because of the lean and straight. How <laughs> guilty is chest? <laughs> yeah. So maybe not super big breasts, unless now here's the thing: genetics get in the way of some of this. I'm seeing this, and I'd say there there might be kind of a boyish body with not not super curvy, right? A Taurus body would be curvy. Right, a Venus, but Venus and Aries. This is like the last chart we just saw, where we had Taurus rising, but the Venus was in a Mars sign. The Venus was in detriment, so she wasn't being herself. She was being Mars, and in this case, Mars is in Leo, right? Mar and Leo's is a hair diva. Leo is is kind of broad, probably a large back, large shoulders, um, you know, because that, those are the parts of the body that are ruled. So I would say that this this person might not be super tall, but might be quite broad. And might not be, uh, and might not be super feminine, not, you know, all woman, but not be, but not be overly interested in things that are too feminine, um, and and might also have a little bit of a competitive streak. Let's move to the next one. See, see how I, and once again, I keep mixing in manner with physicality. Oh, thanks. She said, all spot on. Thank you. Okay, I think this is Diana. Yep. Okay. Okay, well, first of all, <clears throat> ooh. Oh, first of all, we've got a planet exactly opposing the ascendant, almost exactly opposing it. We've got the sun. So the sun's going to do have something to say about it, about who we are, what we look like. And the sun's in Leo, so we got another hair diva here. Or we've got or hair or hair is important. Or we'll, we'll say what well, the, the hair statement it might be important. Now but but it's exactly the opposite, right? It's ex, it's opposing. So it, so hair might be a problem. <laughs> right? Hair and um hair might be an issue like not uh, I might not want to give a shit about hair but have to is might might be where this this thing goes with goes. Um, okay, so it's it's very much ruled by Saturn, right? It's Aquarius rising, ruled by Saturn. Let's see anybody uh, applying to him. Oh, look at that! The Jupiter would have been applying. We can say kind of technically. Hey, am I right about the hair thing? I wish it were thicker and more manageable. Okay. Ah, see, there is the more the more manageable thing. There it is. The 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 the, the struggle with the hair. The struggle to be hair diva. Because Saturn is the you know, Aquarius is the opposite of Leo, 
So we've got a Leo planet in Leo uh, aspecting the ascendant, trying, trying to bring the bring the Herodiva thing to us, tr trying to give us the mane of the lion, but the Saturn gives us the problem. So let's go and see what once again what it said about Saturn and what it said about Aquarius, and then also I think it was Jupiter was sextiling, but they're both retrograde. So corporature, cold and dry, middle stature. Complexion pale, muddy, eyes little and black, looking downward, broad forehead, lumpish and pleasant countenance. That's lovely. Either holding is that's mean. Sh shoulders broad and large, many times crooked, belly somewhat lank, thighs spare. Now this is oxid. This is an Oriental Saturn. If Saturn is Oriental, the sun, the stature is more short, but decent and well composed. So this is, I think, the first important. This is the first important thing. Oh, and we can actually look at it, um, when we come back to the chart. We'll go over Occidental and Oriental for everybody. Um, but I think this is more germane. Short that this person is probably relatively short. Let's look at Aquarius. Squat, thick corporature. <clears throat> okay, so also kind of inclined to squ shortness, but a, a squatness to it now. Well composed body, not tall, long visage, sanguine complexion. The body, a party is black in hair and complexion sanguine with distorted teeth. Oh, if it's in Capricorn, I see. Otherwise, um, I have observed the party is of clear white skin or fair. So once again, it looks like fair, a com fair complexion, short, kind of short and squat, um, hair flaxen or yellow. And so kind of this thing about pure skin and yellow. So there seems to be a thing about the skin. Now let's go back and look at the Jupiter for a second, because we have the Jupiter in there with him too. Upright, straight, and tall. The Jupiter was less, let's see, lovely complexion, full and fleshy, high forehead, large, deep belly, proportion, thighs, and legs. I think, okay, let's come back to the chart. What I think is, what else? Anybody else? So we got the sun thing going on with the hair, and probably once again, I think broad shoulders when I think of the sun, right? I think of kind of there's a broadness that I think of when I think of the sun, and same. Then Jupiter tends to be tall and straight. Thank you, Lil. But but I'm going to go with where the, Sat, the Saturn and Aquarius both talked about kind of short and squat, a short squat well composed. So I'm going to go with short and a, a kind of a shorter and a shorter and a paler person persona um, here is what. I, and notice, remember that retrogradation brought people towards uh, being able to gain weight a little bit more easily. Same thing with Jupiter. Um, with the Jupiter here that it's aspecting. I think there may be issues with going up and down in weight a little bit in this chart. Um, I think that probably the natural weight is very well proportioned and that there might be a going, and see that, and the moon in Cancer also confirms that for me. I think that there might be a little bit of moving up and down in weight for the person. I think that um, not particularly tall, not taller than five, six, in my opinion. How tall are you, Diana? I'm not taller than five six, I bet. You still with us? Okay. <laughs> oh, here we go. More broad hips. Five five. Weight has been an issue. Both health issues, but weird family issues. Ah, interesting. That was one with weird family issues. Oh, family family health oriented issues? Probably. <laughs> um, interesting. All right, so five, five under five six, as I said, broader in the hip region. Ah, and the dieting. Okay, so and and so one of the things about um, Aquarius that I've noticed is that there, te there there tends to be a fundamentalism in the in the background of some sort. Um, either you like you might if you often you find it in the fourth house you might come from a fundamentalist background or there or in this case like there may have been a fundamentalism about being thin and making you diet and that kind of thing so um, often there's like a, there's like a, a thing that we don't swerve from and that everybody is trying to kind of do and uh, or that we need to break away from or that we're continuously you know Aquarius is breaking kind of finding itself breaking from all right great let's move on.
Oh, wait, I keep opening the wrong thing. Layla. Now, I know this physicality very well, so I maybe should go to someone else. But just for... Now, actually, one of the things I will say is moon on the ascendant represents a round face. And Layla has those cute little chubby cheeks that make her face look really round. So that that kind of tracks. Um, for those of you who are new to us, Layla was using a completely different chart, and she's now working with another one. She she's kind of trying to nail down the time. <coughs> so <clears throat> we've been looking at this chart <coughs> to confirm whether or not it's correct, and I think the moon on the ascendant with that little round face of hers makes quite a bit of a so round face. For the moon is definitely a thing so that's something to think about they call that the physiognomy of the moon and one of the main things about about layla is layla is extremely unafraid to um assert herself in uh, via questions and as a res and so we've got this mercury moon and mars and mercury rules curiosity mercury and moon are both the mind mars is the assertiveness and it's right there on the ascendant. And so for, for I don't know, for weeks, for maybe 12 weeks, Layla was the only person that spoke in our, in our class. Like she was the only, like we, I didn't hear anybody's voices. Matter of fact, it might even be until like week 15 or 16. I didn't hear anybody's voice, anybody else's voice until we were almost completely done with the course, except for Layla. That's a really excellent. And I think in, on one level, this is a really excellent confirmation of manner. So we've got quite a few things going on here. And remember what they said, if you're looking for the planet that is, if you have more than one planet in the ascendant, in this case, we're using Mercury, Moon, and Mars. And for those of you who are new, we use the five degree rule. If a planet is within five degrees of a cusp, we consider it to belong to the house. So in this case, Mercury and the Moon are at 20 degrees, the ascendant is at 23, and we consider Ah, and so we consider Mercury and the moon being in the first house, okay? So in this particular case, what's the closest? The Mercury, the moon, the Mars, the Mars is, Mars is really the closest. Mercury is in detriment there. The moon is, the moon is there, but here's the thing. In this particular case, I think that we need to, we need to use the Mercury moon, in my opinion. And the reason I think so is because the moon is the transmitter. The moon is the transmitter. She's the one that transmits the celestial influences down. She's, she's the reason we experience whatever we experience. And so, and she also is the co-ruler of every chart. She co-rules every matter. That means she's the co-ruler of the body in this particular question we're asking about the body that means we must no matter what we ask about in any natal chart we should always look at the moon so that's something for you new people is that our our concept of the moon is way 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 more complex than in natal astrology and she has she has a lot more to do with how things work and whether or not things work and in this chart she's working for the ruler of the ascendant Notice that, right? The moon is now working for the ruler of the ascendant. She, so is Mercury, mind you, but the moon really. And so as a result, in my opinion, I think this moon Mercury is the important thing, even though the Mars is closer. The Mars is definitely there. We see him, we hear him, we talk to him, right? But there are a few things that make me think that I'm right. Two is, how young she looks for her age. One is, another one is how young her voice is. Another one is the curiosity, how overwhelming, how the Mars is really working for the Mercury on some level. It's, it, at least in this, in our, uh, in our uh, situation, the Mars is working for the, for the Mercury. Now, but let's just, 
just to be on the safe side, let's look and see. So we're looking for Sagittarius, we're looking for Moon, for, Mer for Mercury, for uh, Moon, Mercury, and Mars. Now, the Mars is Oriental, or he's, well, he's not Oriental of the Sun, mind you, I don't think, right? So mean in stature, little head of smooth body, uh, let's see, but generally middle stature, strong in bones, big, lean rather than fat, complexion brown, ready, or a high color, visage round, hair, okay, another visage is face, so another round face, okay, so that, that's one for Mars and for Moon. Their hair red or satty flax, and we know that's not the case because she's from Pakistan, and many times crisping, unless she's been flat, uh, hennaing, and many times <clears throat> crisping her curly, sharp hazel eyes, and they piercing, bold, confident countenance. Okay, let's look at what it says for Mercury. Oh, did I not put Mercury in here? Maybe I didn't. I, I skipped him. What do you have to say? Hold on a second. Thank you, Maria. Okay, I, I skipped him. I'm so sorry. But uh, let's look at, well, we can get kind of an idea from, oh, shit. Hold on a second. Let's go back to the chart, and I will tell you what he says. I'm going to use Bonatti since I'm right here with him. And you know what I'm going to do? Hold on one second. Okay. High stature, straight, thin, spare body, high forehead, somewhat narrow, long face. Long nose, fair eyes, neither perfectly black or gray, thin lips and nose, little hair on the chin, but much on his head, um, inclining to blackness. You must observe Mercury than all the planets for having any aspect to a planet. He does more usually partake of the influence of that planet than any other does. If, if he's with Saturn, then heavy. With Jupiter, more temperament. With Mars, more rash. With the sun, more genteel. With Venus, more jesting. With Mercury, more shiftier. With, I mean, with moon, shiftier. So, that's, so let's look at that. Because what he's saying is what, that, what Lily said earlier. Well, this is Lily. Lily's saying the same thing he said, which is you, you really can't tell. <clears throat> so on some level, what we've got is this triple conjunction is really, in my important, it's everything. It's the Jupiter... Oh, but you know, it's not, it's, it's, oh wait, I know what I'm trying to say. This triple conjunction, in my opinion, is showing manner. Jupiter is showing the body based on the sign. Um, Layla, what, do, what is your body? Does your body look more like the Mercury, Mercury dis, um, description or the Mars description? Uh, more material. I'm more slim and slender with very thin bones. Yeah. That's what I said, because I knew you didn't have the, the big bones. And you, yeah. and you wouldn't have the, the it, now see the thing is you wouldn't have a moon body either because the lunar body no. is, is going to be fleshy and, you know, it's going to be fleshy and round. Yeah. All the flesh is really on the face just. <laughs> right. Exactly. That's what I, and, and, and what do they say? The ascendant is the face, right? Yeah. And so that was kind of my point. Okay. Hold on a second. That was my point. So let's actually look to see what they think is the moon body. Because I'm sure you're not that. Moon, fair stature, whitely colored, the face round, gray, a little long, see the face round, gray eyes, a little lowering, much hair both on the head, face, and other parts, usually one eye a little larger than the other, short hands and fleshy, the whole body inclining to be fleshy, plump, corpulent, and phlegmatic. That's my point. Not like that, right? Layla, that's not yeah, your body. Um, yeah, exactly. That's not your body. Okay, that, that was my, <clears throat> that, that's what I wanted to be. 
<clears throat> that was what I wanted to be sure of. Okay, who else are we, have we have we have we looked at everybody or do we have some other people? Has everybody put theirs in or who hasn't? Let's see. Layla, we did. Diana, we did. Natalie, we did. Okay, so the people who have, if, if you're happy with that, if if uh, if you want to, if you want me to look at yours, I'm happy to look at yours. Those of you who are left. Um, if not, I'm going to go ahead and go back to the, um, to our example charts. And of course, I'm open to answering any questions. <clears throat> As a matter of fact, we we can make this now kind of open answer, uh, open answering to questions, and we can talk about. Uh, we can also now talk about oriental versus occidental here's the sun so any planet that's in this region is oriental of the sun because it's in in an earlier degree or earlier sign so in this planet mercury venus and mars and and saturn are all oriental of the sun that means that these planets will all rise before the sun and set before the sun the moon is occidental of the sun so that's so that means that it will rise after it has risen after and it will rise and it will descend bef um after it will also uh, fall after so in this particular chart we've got gemini rising it's a spring sign and it's a sanguine sign so double sanguine then we got mercury in a winter sign and in a wet sign a cold wet sign double phlegmatic and then we've got this Venus right with it, even though it's it's separating. And Venus is also cold and wet, or you know, or kind of wet, right? So there's a lot of wet in this chart. So this is another chart about expressing emotions, expressing my feelings, expressing what wells up within me. You know, where's the moon? In Taurus. So this Venus Mercury is ruling that. This person is probably a dancer, singer, actor something something performance was or has some kind of talent with that dancing probably since it's a uh, feet since pisces is the feet and mercury is their ruler the ascendant is in pisces which is the feet and so is venus and uh and the rule of the part of fortune is the moon moon is in taurus which is ruled by venus so the feet i think this person's a dancer okay so see even that kind of thing can kind of be surmised by what we're just looking at just going straight into that knowing that venus mercury is usually some kind of performing art and that so that gives us an idea into the manner immediately uh but what does the person look like now gemini would make them kind of tall but we just looked at we just looked at the this person should be small a, a straight body i think this person is kind of shortish straight i think this person looks like it might be a perfect body for a ballerina because we know that Pisces is short. I think that this person is a dancer. I think this person is not particularly short, but I think that they've got probably like a, a slim, straight, kind of flat chested body. <clears throat> and they're not super, super tall, don't have super big bones, and are probably very attractive physically and somewhat artistic in something. And I think it's dance. And I think this person might be a ballet dancer or may have some kind of background with ballet. Anything else connecting the Mercury here? No. Okay, so that's my that's my surmising of this smallish stature, slim, not slim and slim and and you know not not uh, slim and flat. You know, so slim and somewhat androgynous, but pretty. If they weren't so pretty, might be andro might be considered boyish. Might be a little curvy. Right, because the, the the Pisces might make them a little bit on the curvy side. This would make them tall and straight, but but Mercury can't be himself, and he's with the exaltation ruler of the sign he's in. So really, the Venus is going to take over. So really, maybe what we can say is this person is curvier. I think that there is a little bit of this tall this tall straight, but there is a beauty to this person, a physical beauty to this person, and a curviness. Um, but I think that I still think this person's a dancer. All right, let's move to the next one. Any questions?
observations. And once again, if I didn't get to you, I'm at the place where I, I don't really know who's who's here. Okay. Thank you, Dinah. Yeah, we're towards we're pretty much towards the end. Hold on a second. Let's see how many people we still have. Wow. A lot of people stayed. Hey, everybody. Um, okay, well, great. Um, if you want me to just kind of continue, that's fine. We'll continue. If you wanna if you have questions, now's a great time to ask your questions. Do terms matter for appearance? Good question, Amy. Fantastic question. I to be honest, I don't think so. However, what I will say about that, terms matter. This is how what I where I think terms matter. And or rather, I'll say two things about terms. <clears throat> if you were, if you, it sounds like you kind of have some understanding of that. And so, what you might know about terms is that one of the main usages for terms was predictive. So they they used the terms, the terms of the ascendant, and they perfected the term of the ascend the ascendant based on the term. So they created they created based on a right ascension this whole kind of way of kind of um, perfecting or advancing um, the the terms. So I think that primarily they were using the terms um, in a predictive way. The other thing I think is that, and we talked about this last week, if you know, if you know your, hold on a second, I'm going to bring it up. If you know your, your essential dignities, let's say, Let's say you've got a planet at 14 degrees of Capricorn, okay? That means that the outline of all of the planets who are participating in that sign would be Saturn, Mars, let's say it's nighttime, Moon, Venus, and Mars, okay? That means that Saturn has five points. He gets five for domicile. Mars gets five points for four for exaltation and one for fall. So Saturn and Mars are really very strongly involved. However, Moon and Venus are also involved in this sign. What if you have a Moon-Venus conjunction? If you have a Moon, let's say you, and it's not in Capricorn. It's not in Capricorn. Let's say you've got, you've got Jupiter at 14 degrees of Capricorn, but you also have this Moon-Venus conjunction. That Moon-Venus conjunction is going to help you, is a way to help you with your Jupiter. It's one of the ways. So you know, we, we've been looking at these dignities as just, oh, how does it make my planet strong? But these are the planets that are all participating in that degree of the sign that your planet is in. So at 14 degrees, Saturn, Mars, the Moon, and Venus are all participating in that sign. And hey, look, I've got this Mars Venus conjunction or this Moon Venus conjunction. That Moon Venus conjunction is a key to your Jupiter. So in that way, yes, terms can matter. But no, in matters of appearance, I don't think so. And I didn't use them necessarily in this particular one. I, I'm, I'm bringing this back in because this is a, a little kind of secret thing that I kind of discovered for myself when I'm looking at and maybe you understood it and maybe you didn't. Any other questions? Feel free, please. As a matter of fact, I'm going to stop the recording and 